Hi everyone, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein, and together with ChessLecture.com, I'd like to welcome you to today's video. Now today, I want to show you an amazing idea that Aronian used against Geary, and of course both of these guys don't need any introduction, world top 10 players, and completely destroyed Geary who is an opening specialist. He knows openings inside and out. And the idea that he used is so important that I feel like you guys can actually use it yourself with success. And the reason why I also want to present to you this game is because the ultra-solid hedgehog structure that Gear used against the London system is one of the reasons that Aronian got to execute his idea. This idea is very much fresh. So let's jump right into the game. d4, knight f6, bishop f4, the London system, which at first looks kind of harmless if you think about it. People typically play the London system to just get out of opening theory, but these days this is an outright weapon in its own class. e6, very solid move. E3, C5. This is actually one way to challenge the center. And after knight D2, I like knight D2 over C3 because it gives white flexibility with the C pawn later on. Pawn takes, pawn takes. Giri plays bishop to E7. So notice that Giri is really smart about his D pawn as well. He doesn't want to commit the pawn to D5. That would give white's knight this beautiful E5 outpost. And you guys probably know what happens with those outposts. That's going to be really good attack for white. So that's why bishop e7, knight f3, castles is played. Bishop d3. Notice how both sides are playing sneaky. Black is not committing the pawn to d5. White is not committing the pawn to c3 or c4 just yet. b6. Very much an expert move. He knows that the knight may end up going to e5, but d6 is going to kick the knight right back. He also knows that the bishop in the London system, or black is going for the hedgehog formation, is really well placed on the long diagonal. And that's the reason behind Geary's development. Castles. And now, bishop to b7. There is argument to be said about which bishop is stronger. The d3 bishop, which is eyeing the king or the b7 bishop which controls this long diagonal. And therefore, one could make an argument for the move bishop a6. And the idea of bishop a6 is very straightforward. You trade off the defender of the light squares, or the attacker of your king, and after knight takes, d5 is not so bad anymore because this bishop is not going to get stuck behind his pawn. Aronian, on the other hand, may think twice about taking the bishop, and that is why the pawn is still on c2. He never played c3, if you guys think about it. He actually can entertain the idea of playing c4. And I have a suspicion that's the reason why white kept the pawn on c2. Because after this logical move d5, right, with the idea d takes c, creating what we call iqp, which is a very much a static weakness, and black is going to be better, white is going to go for the hanging pawns formation. After pawn takes, pawn takes, these are called hanging pawns, which are not as bad as IQP, but still potentially weak pawns. And if black, let's say Geary plays knight c6, hitting the d pawn, white now has a couple of options. One idea is to play knight b3, and it's not easy to attack the c and the d pawn for black. Yes, you can still play rook c8, queen d7, rook fd8, but the two knights do, and the bishop do, a pretty good job defending the hanging pawns, which in turn are really taking away a lot of key squares. And the position is really complex. Attacking players prefer white. Players who love solid chess may prefer black. So this was an option that Geary had. He didn't go for it, partially because the pawn is likely still on c2. So these little nuances, guys, is very important to pay attention to in these openings. So bishop b7, rook e1. Again, Aronian is baiting black to play this move d5. That's never going to happen. 
d5 is a really bad move. Like I said earlier, not only do you lock the bishop up, you give white this beautiful outpost, knight e5, and now it's pretty easy attack if you think about it, right? The king is, the two bishops are looking at the king, the knight on e5 stops black's army from helping out, and all it just takes the queen to simply lift off and then g4, g5, and it's practically game over. Of course, black has some defensive resources, but that's not how you play this opening. So, uh, Giri plays this move d6. And now here's the question for everyone. How on earth are you going to break through to attack black's king? There's no obvious outpost in the center, right? This knight is not very easy to get rid of. These pawns are pretty rock solid. And it looks like black is doing pretty good out of the opening. So that is why pay attention to what happens next. In just a few moves, Aronian creates something out of nothing. And what do I mean by that? Well, he creates a deadly attack that only Aronian can execute. This really takes a lot of creativity on White's part. So he plays first c3. Now that the bishop's on b7, he doesn't mind playing c3. a6, that's a typical move. Again, black is going for the typical hedgehog structure, right? Everybody knows about these pawns. a6, b6, d6, e6. In many openings, you can execute this setup. It's called hedgehog. And now, knight g5. This is an absolute brilliant move. And at first, it looks like, okay, well, it's pretty easy. You just want to play queen c2 next, right? Attack h7, and somehow go and checkmate black's king. But it's actually not as simple as it looks, because obviously Gear is going to play h6 and say, well, you're not going to sacrifice the knight anywhere. You're going to have to go back. But this is all part of White's plan, guys. Pay attention to what Aronian does next. It is imperative, and I repeat, it's very important that in order for Aronian's attack to succeed, the pawn has to be on h6. Again, it's not obvious why, but just pay attention to what happens next. Now he plays knight g to e4. Again, counterintuitive move. You are trading pieces, right? How are you going to attack? But it's very important the knight on f6 gets traded. Knight takes e4, I feel like helps white, but it's also a logical move from Giri because he wants to trade as many pieces as possible to secure his king. Although knight d5 is a much more interesting option. And the reason why knight d5 I like here is because after bishop g3, black now gets to execute a very interesting idea, f5. Surprisingly, knight in the middle of the board has no squares. If you think about it, right, guys, there's no obvious move for this knight. And that's why knight d5 was a much stronger move. Well, it doesn't mean that bishop g3 has to be played. There are other ideas. We can try to protect the bishop, perhaps. Maybe activate our queen. Uh, maybe there are other ideas. So, But definitely, it's not obvious why knight d5 Geary did not play the move. To me, it looks a little bit like a logical idea. You don't want to trade the knight. But Geary said, you know, I don't see anything wrong with knight takes e4. And generally speaking, even if you don't play this exact sequence, this exact opening, the attacking idea that Aronian uses here is simply spectacular. So knight takes e4, and now simply bishop takes e4. So Giri is saying, I'm just going to get my pawn to d5 one way or another, and guess what? You have nothing. Although to me, it's a little bit of simplification, because after bishop takes d5, bishop c2, you guys are finally seeing the point of why the pawn has to be on h6, right? It's going to be very difficult to play g6 move, right? That's the whole point. Bishop g5, though, this is part of Geary's plan. He wants to trade the bishops off. And now, guys, can you try to find Aronian's next move? Well, it's not that difficult. He plays queen d3, maven 1. And you guys will probably say, well, obviously Geary saw that, and that's why he plays g6. And now the big question for everyone. What is all this idea for white? Why did we go for all this 
If we just take on g5 or take on b8 or move the bishop, white has absolutely no advantage. So there has to be reason, right guys, why white went for this. So why don't you take a moment here to try to figure it out. This is a very important tactical idea that, again, if you put the pawn back on h7, right, nothing works. But with the pawn on h6, this shot wins the game. And very important idea indeed. All right, if you need more time, go ahead and pause the video. And the spectacular idea is, of course, sacrifice. Rook takes e6, x clan. It's funny how black has a choice. You can take the bishop, you can take the rook. As the great attacker player of all times, Mikhail Tal said, well, your opponent can only take one piece at a time. Well, it's kind of like a joke, but there is a lot of truth to it because you cannot take both the rook and the bishop. And if you take the rook, well, obviously it's a simple mate in two. And if you take the bishop, then the rook is now alive, and we're going to do another tactic, guys. By now, I hope everybody sees the tactic. If not, please, again, make sure to pause the video. And it's a desperado rook. Of course, the move is rook takes g6 check. Obviously, pawn takes, queen takes. Same idea of a mate. And that's about time for Giri to resign, because he realizes that even if you don't take the rook, the desperado rook will either go to g8 or take here with queen h7 mate. So top 10 opponent, you know, obviously this is not a classical game. This is a, a blitz game, but nevertheless, a top 10 player fell for this very important trick. And again, it looks like black has a very safe position right here after knight takes e4. But in reality, this knight g5, learning the point to h6, regroup into e4, and if black doesn't find the only move knight to d5, he is basically completely lost once he goes into the sequence. Because if you don't play bishop g5, well, your structure is okay, but the two bishops plus the attack will give white the win advantage almost every single time. Because you can never play g6 nor f5. That means the whole diagonal is in trouble. And finally, if you play knight to d7, queen d3, knight f6, all white needs to do is find a way to get rid of this knight. It's just a matter of time before the attack comes crashing through. The simplest plan is, of course, bishop to e5. So I hope you guys learn from this miniature what to do for white and vice versa. If you are black and you like to play these kind of hedgehog structures, you have to know how to counter it. Don't just go with obvious moves. I showed you an improvement for black. Knight d5 was the key move earlier on and to try to keep the game more balanced. Not an obvious move at all, especially in blitz, but this is the only move that allows black to stay in the game. So thank you very much. This was Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein for ChessLecture.com. Goodbye.